Hi, all. You made it to the end of the research bazaar. Woo! It's not quite over yet. We have this session and then the reception, but uh, we're getting close to the end and we're um, getting to wrap up the themes that we've discussed over the last couple of days, bringing back all the different interdisciplinary research that we've seen that uses data science and, and computing and all those aspects to it. And so for the last panel, for the last session here, um, this is the last like official seated session, we're gonna have an informal reception afterwards. Um, reminder that we'll be following the, carp the Research Bazaar's Code of Conduct. Sorry, I talk about the Carpentry's Code of Conduct a lot and that substituted in my brain. Um, and so be kind and respectful to one another and uh, everyone's differing backgrounds and identities and career experience levels. Um, and one last thank you for the planning committee. So we really appreciate all the planning committee. I think they deserve a round of applause. So. And then thanks again to our sponsors who provided the funds to make this event free. And we really appreciate that we were able to have a free conference with food. You can do claps too. And then a reminder about the art exhibit, the art exhibit for the Research Bazaar. Right now it's still up throughout the Research Bazaar. You can see one example of it in this room right here. Um, and so you can still find it throughout at the end of this session. But after that, it will move to this room in the upper left-hand corner of the slide or kind of in the middle of the diagram, but uh, uh, 1160 and it will stay there for a month. So if you missed it over the last couple of days, you can still see the art exhibit in 1160 over the course of the next month. Okay, I'm gonna hand it off to Gavin who will be running the closing panel now. Um, Sarah is amazing. I don't know if anybody else agrees with me, but I just wanted to say thank you to Sarah for everything. Um, so uh, I will admit, uh, you might be thinking, who is this guy, Gavin, and why is he, you know, facilitating a panel about something that he knows very, very little about? Yeah. Um, that's what I thought when I got asked to do this panel. Um, but uh, so this year's uh, research bazaar is focused on shaping futures with data and computing. Obviously, you all know that. Um, the bazaar opened with exciting talks on building digital tools for new avenues, a meeting making, um, and policy reform. So we heard from Martin Foys and his work on the open source digital humanities platforms, um, digital MAPA and virtual MAPA to find new connections in historical maps and texts. Holly Gibbs walked us through the GLUE Labs, awesome uh, acronym. Um, I wonder if it was an acronym or a backronym. You know, backronym, you remember that? You find an, a thing and then you fill out. All right, anyway. Um, GLUE's lab work uh, to find new approaches to tracking the cattle supply chain in the Amazon to end deforestation. Um, so throughout uh, the bazaar, we've heard from a variety of speakers on different tools and methods used in computing and data analysis. And the purpose of this closing session is to provide an opportunity to discuss ideas, like kind of moving ideas into action. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Gavin Luter, a managing director of an initiative at UW-Madison called the University Alliance. And essentially we are a, it's cute, right? What we did with that university, the C-I-T-Y instead of S-I-T-Y. Um, yeah, so what we are trying to do is make UW-Madison more accessible to local governments all across the state of Wisconsin. UW-Madison is a giant bureaucracy and it's hard to figure out exactly where to tap in. Um, we have a lot of smart people on here, uh, around here who wanna do good, meaningful projects but sometimes they don't always know how to get in contact with the people who need it the most. So what we do is we run a program called the University Year Program, where we ask local governments to apply with the challenges that they have. Um, so we listen, and then we try to get them to the people on campus who can take those projects on as projects in their classes, as projects for independent studies, or maybe even with an individual professor's research agenda, or maybe even a staff member's expertise. Um, and so uh, we are all about turning ideas um, into action uh, because local governments really are short staffed, they're short capacityed, um, and so they need additional support to do that work. So I, I gather, I venture a guess, um, that's part of the reason why I was asked to, uh, to help facilitate this panel is because ideas into action is kind of this, the space where we live, this kind of translation between academia um, and the world of practice. I don't like to say the real world, I just say the world, world of practice. We're not living in some fake imaginary world here on campus, but we're living in the world of, uh, of ideas is. Um, and we need to figure out how to move those into the world of practice. Um, and that's why we are grateful uh, to have an amazing set of panelists. 
um, to share their insights um, about how to move ideas into action. So the way that this is really um, formatted is that I'm gonna present all the uh, different bios of our panelists, um, and then I'm going to pose a question to them, and they have um, had time to think about that question. Um, and so they actually have some PowerPoint slides that they're gonna um, run us through the, uh, their answer to that question. Um, and, uh, and, and what I'm gonna ask is that if people generally have questions, we're gonna try to hold them uh, to the end. But, um, but I have a question that I'm gonna queue up and they're, they're gonna answer the question. So panelists, please remember to just tell me when to advance your slides and we'll go from there. And if I'm doing something wrong, just say, you're doing something wrong, go back. Um, okay, so with that, um, and I've pronounced, I've, I've been practicing on pronouncing names. I'm sorry if I get anything wrong, but I'm, I'm gonna do my best. Um, all right, so we have, uh, and I'll just ask you to wave your hand when I introduce you, uh, Raul Chatterjee um, is an assistant professor in computer sciences. His research focuses on securing, uh, the, interf securing the interface between human and machines, such as user authentication systems and smart homes. Um, he has partnered with multiple industries as well as university IT departments to conduct research on sensitive data, as well as your passwords. Um, Esteban Chiriboga is an environmental uh, specialist with the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. He uses data and research to help tribal governments to make informed natural resource decisions. Joao Doria is an assistant professor in precision agriculture in the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences at UW-Madison. His work focuses on using data and digital technology to monitor and improve the health and welfare of livestock animals. Mariah Knowles is a uh, researcher and PhD candidate, uh, wave, yeah, yeah, hi. Um, PhD candidate here at UW-Madison. She teaches kids and adults how to code, um, and she studies AI ethics with mixed methods. Uh, and then finally, uh, so last but not least, of course, we have Jay Winston, um, is a learning practitioner and graduate student at UW-Madison. She uses data and research to improve teaching and learning in the workplace and in academia. Um, wow, like what an amazing panel to all have in the same place at the same time sharing their perspectives. And we're so grateful for that. Um, again, please hold your questions till the end for panelists, till the end of the session. Um, we will ask them as many of them as we can within the time allocated. We might run over time, but you know what? That's okay, because the only thing that we have is a reception afterwards. So it's okay. There's nobody that's gonna kick us out or anything like that. If you gotta go, you gotta go, but um, hang in there. We can, we can certainly um, uh, go over, uh, but, but definitely you can join the reception late and you're not gonna miss anything. Um, so uh, the first question is for Mariah. Um, what are some of the pressing concerns around AI and how can we as researchers contribute to those discussions? And what are, uh, we, do I stop there or just keep going? Okay, keep going, keep going. All right, and um, what are, see I'm telling you, anybody could have done this panel. You, you could have been up here. Um, what are examples of issues that commonly arise in this area? Yep, we're gonna go. What's up? <laughs> Yo. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna solve all of ethics in about seven minutes. Love it. We've been spending like 2,000 years on it and uh, we're gonna bring it to a close. One slide too. One slide, great. Yeah, yeah, summed it up. Uh, <laughs> AI ethics covers a lot of what seems like distinct concerns, but it's good to view them as kind of a bundle of related concerns that kind of all lean on one another. Um, and it's always good to remind ourselves that the problems that we run into aren't really anything new. Uh, they're just flashier than they were last year. And now there's a chat AI thing that has grown in popularity since I wrote this slide, uh, which is always fun. But good thing that I say that uh, stuff doesn't change very fast is that lets me argue, but that I don't have to do my stuff that much. Um, so with AI, I try to just sum up every single list of all the concerns into one slide there on that left column. There's concerns over people just being jerks, right? And just having bad intentions with models. Um, people misrepresenting their uh, intentions and so on, uh, such as mortgage companies using new tools for explaining their decisions as a way to mask 
uh, their true biases, say, against like queer couples and stuff by saying, oh, no, no, it's because of this difference in your income or whatever. And it turns out that um, there's also concerns around like social media and, and you now all the news about Twitter is about uh, what's his face instead of bots. But there used to be concerns mostly about like bots spreading disinformation, um, Russian, uh, uh, a uh, Russian IRA or whatever their acronym is was like spreading misinformation around uh, U.S. politics for a while there, and the U.S. got pretty mad about that. Um, there's issues around how the hell do you moderate uh, an entire online space, um, and that uh, it's just hard to pin down exactly where these lines are on moderation for like a global community, knowing that there are a lot of local kind of. Uh, 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 distinctions that matter. Who owns data matters. That uh, happens a lot in health settings, right? Uh, where the data is stored can affect the laws that apply to it. Um, there's concerns over surveillance, over one entity having so much more power than everyone else, or even a startup that does do good work and is well-meaning being bought out by a company who you trust less. Right. Um, there's the like classic sense of bias, but like I tend to avoid using the word bias. I don't care about bias. Everything's biased. I care about unfair distributions of harms and goods. I think it, that gets us back to what matters. Um, issues of people being systematically excluded or um, uh, algorithms made to draw people to a product turning into an algorithm that causes people to be addicted to the product. Um, I, probably, I can't remember there's this story that someone told me of like their best user was someone who was addicted to their product but he, when he was in the hospital he was like playing their games and that's like kept him going for a while so it was like this wild story of addiction there um we also just want them to be safe and uh effective and to do what we say they do there's issues around privacy um a fun one i'm going to try and turn into a guest lecture for next tuesday is like when do we owe people a notice that they're using a product or something that's recommended to them by AI or AI is involved in it, or when do they when do we owe them an explanation and what actually does that mean, right? There was a job talk last week in the iSchool that was all about explanation, but then when Alan Rubel pressed on it, the head of the department, um, there was like this uh, conflict between Alan and the, uh, the the job speaker about uh, does explanation mean something more substantive or is it just a um, way to get someone to use a product? right kind of an explanation on its face but not an explanation in fact um there's concerns over well do we even need ai or under what conditions should there be a human alternative involved um and so on. i'm not going to belabor this whole list right it's every single thing um but the other half of the question which is why i wanted you to keep reading is like well where did these come up right so i like giving examples usually at the start of a talk um there's my favorite case uh, which is a police department in Florida made an algorithm to predict criminals, not predict regions of crime, uh, but to predict individuals. And then they, they use the output of that um, to justify harassing people and their families until they would move, which did reduce crime rate, it turns out. Uh, and they use the existence of it to justify collecting tons of data on their citizens. Thing is, is that their nearby counties that didn't use the algorithm also saw the same de uh, decrease in crime rate. Um, there's the case of early on in the pandemic when we were first getting vaccinations, we had to decide who to give them to with our limited supply, especially within health. So there's an algorithm that a a uh, famous hospital uh, made and it awarded all the vaccines to people who weren't on the front lines. Uh, and so they got in trouble for that. Um, within education, there's tons, but specifically I'm thinking about um, value add algorithms for scoring teachers, and then those scores being the only basis for firing teachers. And then you have situations where people's scores are um, kind of don't really give the picture of who they are as a teacher because they teach subjects that the algorithm wasn't made for, right? They, they teach something that isn't uh, measurable by the algorithm and then what goes into it kind of excludes them and then they're fired even though they're a great teacher or vice versa, right? They aren't given raises or so on um, when the express use of the algorithm was to fire people, right? To reduce the um, amount of employees on the public budget. Um, and then there's the Uber case where it killed someone because it didn't know what a jaywalker was, right? Because its training data didn't involve that. And in any of these 
um, uh, uh, areas, a number of those concerns are going to show up, right? You're never just talking about fairness. You're never just talking about privacy. You're always having to balance between them um, and go back to maybe older cases or older ways to think through these things, right? And so in the data ethics class that I teach from time to time, and I'm guest lecturing at next week, um, the whole point of that class is to teach students how to reason through cases like this without just going, well, how do I measure fairness? I'm like, well, only a, a, there's several dis, uh, definitions of fairness and only some of them are measurable and even those con uh, conflict, right? So what can we do? The number one thing I think I can sum up in my seven minute, however much time I have, uh, is to align your values with your stakeholders because so much of the literature and discussion around AI ethics now is around pinning down some set of principles that we ought to follow, um, but that style of reasoning comes from bioethics, right? Um, which, you know, we have like World War II, some shitty stuff happened and now we hear about it every time we do an IRB. Um, uh, uh, doctors and, and patients are aligned in their thinking in some sense, right? They care about the health of the patient. And so that style of thinking around principles that AI ethics is directly borrowing from and trying to kind of mirror as a way to kind of kickstart, right? To take someone who's done it well and go launch off that. That little distinction's kind of gotten missed that we aren't aligned when we create AI tools with the uh, people, right? The people at the, at the, at the um, district level aren't aligned with the teachers when they create an algorithm to assign scores to fire them. Right, And so it's good to make sure that we're aligned with them because that matters for just the way that we reason around principles. Um, the other one is that uh, I'm usually talking to academics and academics don't often engage with people outside of academia as much. And there's so much thinking on how to do design ethically in, in academia and very little actually in practice, right? Um, except for in very small areas where there is engagement. Um, I, I kind of mentioned this earlier with fairness, learn how to reason around substantive concepts, right? The ones that you can't measure, but we can still reason about just as well. That's how law works, right? Is we have these concepts that you might not be able to pin down exactly, but you can pin down well enough and use to think through why stuff matters at all. And then I guess ultimately uh, to ask yourself real hard from time to time, what is it that you're actually trying to get right? Um, because that reflective question will take you a long way. Um, with concerns, I thought I was going to see Megan up on that list. I don't know if anyone's seen the movie, the the killer AI. You know, um, the wild thing is my partner's name is Megan, and I was real confused. Oh for my a gosh! Second. No, no, no. The it's M three Egan, but it looks like Megan, and she's an AI that goes to kill people. Um, anyway, I thought that was going to be the top of your your concerns. Um, and just as a fun fact, the education example value added, the value added test scores. Uh, algorithm was based on corn growing algorithms. Um, they thought this is how much corn should grow based on these conditions. And then if they don't grow, then we're doing something wrong in the production of corn. And then somebody took that and said, oh, we can do that with teachers and how much kids are expected to learn. Yeah. And it was a guy named, um, I don't even want to mention his name, but University of Tennessee. I was at UT when they started to market that algorithm um, and sell it basically on the private market as a way to evaluate teachers. Anyway, just a little aside, I'm an education nerd also. Um, it is wild. Uh, next, we're gonna go to Jay Winston. I may have introduced her last, but she's gonna go second. Um, and so uh, here we go. I think Jay, you just have one side, right? We're gonna go back to the question. Um, the, uh, the first question is, what are the pitfalls associated with modern analytics and education? Um, and then I'm gonna wait to hear, and then I got another question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, before address, addressing this question, I feel like it's important to reframe. I don't feel comfortable saying that the pitfall is associated with modern analytics more so than I feel that the pitfall is us trying to verify and validate an archaic education system with modern analytics. Uh, when we discuss learning analytics, um, there's always an emphasis on the types of methodologies that we use to harness meaning from that data. And I believe that there should be an equal emphasis on how we collect data 
and the types of data that we're actually collecting. Uh, this emphasis is really important because what we collect and how we collect it is gonna be heavily influenced by some sort of outcome. What do we wanna know that we don't already know? What do we wanna prove? What questions do we have and how can data help us answer them? When we have an idea of where we're headed, it's easier to backwards design the analytical steps and tools needed to get us there. So contextualizing this question allows us to take a step back and acknowledge a larger issue at play in our education system. The adamancy of wanting to use a hammer to solve the issue that clearly requires the use of a flathead screwdriver. Meaning there are many theories, practices, and approaches to learning and education. They all serve their purposes at different times. Yet there's an overemphasis on the traditional stimulus response driven learning environment that we've been so used to. From conversations with educators about their experiences, there also exists a level of complacency that comes with abandoning human centered thinking for the sake of systemization. So when we simplify and streamline and standardize learning, I mean, it happens inevitably when we want to scale. We inadvertently doom our education system to inflexibility. And over time, it becomes obsolete. Simply put, it's not reflective of reality. So all that to say the pitfalls that we may see and associate with modern analytics, I truly believe is modern analytics revealing the pitfalls associated with our education system. To my understanding, that's exactly what data is supposed to do. It allows us to discover useful information that we don't already know. It informs our conclusion, it invokes a level of reflection, and it lends itself to meaningful questions. As our analytical methods continue to modernize, my hope is that it informs the much needed modernization of how we approach teaching and learning um, within our education system. Great. Um, next question. What do learning analytics miss in telling the story of real student needs and taking action to improve educational outcomes? Yeah, so learning analytics is good at providing a general picture and it has the potential to narrow in on individuals. However, there will inevitably be external factors that affect the students' needs within a learning environment. For example, their previous education, life outside of school, socioeconomic status, emotional and social well-being, so on and so forth. But it doesn't help that we create artificial measurements of a student's success and then perpetuate it with data. And I think Mariah was kind of touching on this a little bit with the AI tip. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take standardized testing for an example. Standardized testing was originally developed to determine a student's preparedness for college. However, there are many, many, many studies over the years that have shown that standardized testing really measures socioeconomic achievement gaps and educational inequity. So if we know this information, why do we continue to use standardized testing as a means to measure um, academic success? And also this makes me question the validity of standardized testing as a determinant of academic success. Now don't get me wrong, standardized testing can be helpful in determining a more general landscape. However, it does pose um, some harm when we start assessing individual students' needs. As a learning and development practitioner, I've noticed even in informal learning spaces like work, our measurement strategies are ineffective um, and they don't tell the full story of learning's impact to the business. So these types of approaches to analytics aren't exclusive to formal learning environments. It's a larger data science issue. So the reality remains that the most meaningful data about learners will be the hardest to collect and analyze, yet the most rich and useful. And that's why I'm here today in a room full of data scientists, researchers, and enthusiasts because educators are looking for reliable and valid analytical tools that allow them to directly serve their students' needs. 
They're looking for tools that allow them to capture and analyze more meaningful and nuanced data as well. Take chat GBT, for example, which has taken the world by storm over the last couple of weeks. And I've seen many, many, many comments considering um, how this tool can be utilized and specifically around plagiarism. However, where are the conversations that are considering how this tool and many others like it can be leveraged to inform teaching and learning that prioritizes critical thinking and 21st century problem solving? When we expand our measurement capabilities and also our views about them as well, then and only then will we be better equipped to take action in improving educational outcomes in meaningful ways. Great, and uh, last question. Um, what should instructors and university administrators be thinking about as these tools become commonplace in learning environments? Yeah, so as analytical tools continue to expand and scale at large, I think it's gonna be important to be mindful that analysis is not the end all be all. If anything, it serves as a catalyst for much needed conversations, collaboration, brainstorming, and decision making. And that's exactly what I feel like our students need, an educational experience that reflects reality and prepares them to navigate higher education, professional life, and ultimately the world. I think it's also worth noting that most of our analytical tools are instructor facing, hmm. meaning these tools are designed with instructors in mind to help them better understand their students' needs and positions them to intervene proactively to support them. However, where are the robust analytical tools that are designed with learners in mind? Tools that allow students to visualize, assess, and interrogate data about their own learning, which I feel like solidifies them as critical consumers of data themselves and an owner in their educational success. I mean, that's the traditional market-based analytics approach. Take your Netflix, your Googles, who prioritize user-centered and focused data. This shift in educational ownership creates an environment for deeper learning that prioritizes critical thinking, problem solving, and increases data literacy in what I would consider to be a very data-rich society. Even more, it's empowering for students to identify practices that work for them. And if that's not the epitome of metacognition, then I don't know what is. Uh, I would say that we're really on the cusp of a data revolution, whether we realize it or not. I mean, I have my Apple Watch right here. It's collecting data about me, how many steps, my heart rate, and that informs the decisions that I make every single day. So as we look towards the future of data's role in learning environments, I'm hopeful that instructors and administrators will see the potential that data science and data literacy can play in making educational success the collective responsibility of everyone. I'm confident that we will move diligently and proactively to ensure analytical tools that put every stakeholder a part of the learning journey in a driver's seat. That's from the student to the instructor to administrators, our policymakers. This type of diversity, equity, and inclusion in data conversations and tools, I feel will inevitably lend itself to more diverse, equitable, and inclusive learning environments that students from all walks of life can and will be successful in. And before I wrap up, uh, I think it's important that I highlight some really awesome programs, communities, and initiatives who are having important discussions and advancing learning analytics in meaningful ways right here on UW-Madison's campus. And you'll see here on the screen uh, a handful of resources. Please take a picture if something interests you and follow up on it. Um, there's a lot of great work taking place on campus right now pertaining to learning analytics and how we can leverage data to improve teaching and learning and ultimately improve student outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Hey, uh, next, we're going to hear from Joao Doria. Um, uh, Joao, what are the computational bottlenecks associated with data and applications in dairy science and agriculture as a whole? Switching gears a little bit from learning <laughs> analytics, uh, we're going to move on to uh, ag. So, Joao. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, and don't forget, you got to tell me when exactly to advance. I will. Okay, thank good. you. Yeah, thank I was you. cheating. I, I have five slides in one, so I have to ask him to. Okay. I think you can move um, uh, for the next top point. I guess some of the points are very common problems uh, in other domains. In agriculture, it's not different, but maybe the details associated with these points uh, will sound very peculiar here. So the first point is data collection. Um, we are developing technology to implement in farms and to collect large amount of data. In our research farm here, as you can see in the picture, we have cameras installed. But one uh, very clear bottleneck that we have associated with data collection is that we are dealing with animals, and so our annotation and the gold standard that we need to measure and put together with the sensor data need to be collected, and that sometimes is related to blood samples or ultrasound image for body composition. And so the data alone uh, will inform a little bit, so we need more information from these organisms, in this case from animals, and they are not humans that go to the hospital and, and draw blood samples, you know what they take in terms of med medication. Uh, we need to do and collect all that information. And so building large data sets that are accurate, complete, um, to connect with this fascinating AI technology is the bottleneck to build something useful. Uh, I guess that's um, something we spend money, um, human resource, and ideas on how to be more efficient on collecting um, the response variables that we are most of the time in interest. So the second um, point is related to connectivity. I guess that's an issue um, when you think about farms. Um, the farms are located in remote uh, areas with very poor uh, network bandwidth. We cannot transfer large um, sets of data. And um, if we look at the example we have in our research farm here at UW Madison, um, we have cameras installed there. Um, we are monitoring growth development of um, 200 animals in the, with using these cameras, but we generate not a huge data set if you compare to other areas, that fairly small if you think about other domains, so 300 gigabytes per day. But if we need to transfer that data, it took us, it would take us four days to transfer the whole data. So if we have real time decisions that we need to take, for these animals, for health and for welfare, we're not able to do it. And so that's our farm, that's the, the university farm. Uh, but if you go to other areas that the internet connection will be even worse or maybe not existent, then we need to develop more on the edge computing, cloud computing, how to be more efficient on transferring data. So connectivity right now limits a lot. There is a lot of discussion led, led by USDA uh, industry on how to develop uh, connectivity in rural areas. I guess that's, um, that's a very, um, relevant point. Um, the third one is related, I guess that's not the uh, uniqueness of our field. All the fields will have the same issue with uh, the heterogeneity of the data sets that we are starting to collect more and more. So we have data uh, from different sensors, cameras, wearable sensors, we have genomic data, we have um, weather, economics, and sometimes microclimate from the facilities that we monitor these animals. And so integrating these um, in a way that data analysis will become very efficient um, is not trivial, at least for, for the type of data we are collecting. Uh, and I guess other fields are also uh, facing the same challenge and developing um, quick uh, towards that. But definitely how you manage the data, metadata, uh, with this temporal and spatial um, um, variation, um, it's, it's, it's definitely um, a challenge dealing with data in agriculture and in, in animal science, which is the area I work um, most. Um, the, the fourth one is related to data analysis, but instead of talking about models and type of data, and I try to focus here on uh, the multidisciplinarity, um, the way that works today, at least in agriculture, um, to advance data analysis or how we do data analysis in these large data sets, we have experts in statistics or computer science, and we have experts in um, agriculture with their domain knowledge, and they get together and they try to solve these problems, but that sometimes uh, is not the most efficient way, and we don't have enough uh, multidisciplinarity in terms of training uh, yet, uh, and when I say this, I, I'm talking about the students that have a strong back background in data analysis and statistics, and at the same time, we know a lot about the domain they're working in order to solve more uh, the problems more efficiently. 
And for the collaboration type of multidisciplinarity, um, it's it's easier to find. And I I have examples. I collaborate a lot with uh, professors in computer science and engineering. Uh, Michael uh, is in the committee of one of my students. And so we're going to find more, but maybe we're not, we don't have here um, enough. I mean, for agriculture to develop data analysis faster and solve problems related to data analysis, uh, if we would have this hybrid person with strong domain expertise and at the same time knowing the tools that they need to solve um, the problems. So I just have a picture here with a one, no, uh, before. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, that's a student in my lab. So she, uh, she uh, her background is in animal science and she took the course in computer science and statistics, and she's taking a lot of course in animal science as well, and she's presenting uh, her work with computer vision in one of the open science degree school, uh, school user school last year. Um, so it's a different audience, and she's talking about how she's using high throughput computing and all this infrastructure to analyze the data she's collecting. And on the opposite side, uh, there's other picture. Uh, the next one, it's Rafael, um, he's a, uh, the history is in computer science, but he's taking also all the, cor the, the disciplines and taking the courses in computer science statistics, but now having much more strong background in animal biology. Uh, so Ariane and Rafael go in the same direction, but uh, in a very multidisciplinary uh, way. And, uh, and he's, he's presenting in an animal science meeting. He's worked with computer vision. So I think the multidisciplinarity uh, for training is definitely something that you is a bottleneck right now. Um, but if, and I think if you solve these with majors and minors and certificates, this will definitely advance the field quicker. And lastly, um, data integration. I guess there's a it's a big challenge in the industry, and maybe not our industry only. How we integrate data from different software that's owned by different companies, and how these players, big players, will agree to share data for someone to create value. Um, it's just something we need to figure out and learn more, not only from the analytical standpoint of how to integrate data from different softwares, but how um, this ecosystem will happen um, organically and with all the interest parts happy about um, how they're gonna combine the data streams. Um, yeah, I guess these are somehow related to other fields, maybe some unique aspects, but in my opinion, these are um, some bottlenecks that we face um, in agriculture related to data use and AI technologies uh, to be implemented in the field. Okay, okay great, thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, next we're gonna go to Esteban Chiriboga. Um, Esteban, question for you, in which ways can data help us protect the environment and preserve it for future generations? And what are the pressing environmental concerns that data could impact? Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Um, so, what, uh, how can we protect the environment with data and what do we use the data for? So, I'd like to try and answer the second question in a very simple way, uh, and it's all of them, all the issues. Uh, and I know I'm cheating uh, with that answer, but I'm gonna try to maybe clarify that a little bit as I try to get at question number one. So, just, as a very quick background, the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission is an intertribal agency of 11 Ojibwe tribes in Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And in a nutshell, we implement federal court orders surrounding the off-reservation harvests of natural resources guaranteed by treaties that the tribes signed with the federal government in the 1800s. So the roughly 73 million acres of the ceded territories that are outlined on this map uh, on the slide, uh, they overlap many state, county boundaries, and that means overlapping laws, regulations, and attitudes. Um, so environmental data is often our only and best tool for communicating what tribes are up to and what we're doing in these areas. Now, while these treaties have applied since the day they were signed, states have only recognized their existence since the 1980s, more or less. Wisconsin has a rather dark history of when tribes began exercising those rights by spearfishing off reservation during what is often called the walleye wars, uh, when violence and racism against tribal harvesters occurred at boat landings. Now, much of the fear and anger that some non-tribal people in Wisconsin felt at this time came from a lack of information and good data. 
that led people to fall for this myth that the Indians were going to show up, spear all the fish, destroy the environment, and you know, collapse the tourism industry. To counter this myth, my agency, each year, we count, weigh, and measure every single fish that tribal members harvest as part of their treaty uh, activities, and we publish that information. This data allow us to prove that tribal harvest is sustainable and is usually far less than the total allowable catch for each lake, and that treated harvests have no effect on the ecological integrity of aquatic ecosystems. So in other words, the data we collect protect tribes and individual tribal members from unfair criticism and, we hope, helps reduce the risk of violence at boat landings. Similar data gathering and reporting is done for deer, waterfowl, most other things that um, tribal members harvest. Data is also central to our efforts at protecting ecosystems that these individual species that tribes harvest, uh, that they depend on uh, for their life, for their existence into the future. One way of eliminating a treaty right is to pollute or degrade an ecosystem to the point that it no longer supports the healthy populations of these species. But when it comes to most environmental protection laws, like water and air quality standards, tribes have no power to set or enforce these provisions. So imagine that you are a minority population entirely dependent on a healthy environment and have no legal or enforcement method to protect this thing that you rely on for your life. Data and data analysis are really what we use to try and convince regulatory agencies usually state, state and federal agencies, uh, that tribal perspectives on environmental protection are often the best conservation approach. So water quality standards are one of the best examples uh, of this issue. The state, Wisconsin, uh, in this case, under the Clean Water Act is empowered to set water quality standards. And these are the you know, safe levels of various elements or compounds in water. Now, most people, I think, assume that uh, if water meets these standards, it is not polluted or degraded in some way, but that, that is not the case. Standards for things like copper or arsenic are usually set at the point where aquatic organisms in the water, often insects or insect larvae, begin to show negative impacts, so developmental problems or death. The tribal position is that this level allows the legal degradation from what might be a pristine or unimpacted condition down to the level of the standard and is therefore not protective of treaty resources. So making this case on a water by water basis requires extensive field data collection, data analysis, and the patience and perseverance to communi communicate these perspectives to regulatory agencies. So the last thing I guess I'd like to say is that there's been a lot of attention paid to traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK, over the last few years. Um, and basically, it's the realization that tribal perspectives on how the environment functions are more than just cute stories. Um, and this is, a, this is a very good thing. Um, TEK are, at their core, observational field data that has been gathered over very long timescales. So because survival for, say, a group of native people 5,000 years ago would depend on quality observations of the environment and accurate conclusions of what those observations mean, um, TEK data tend to be rather accurate. There's good motivation for collecting quality data. Um, and that data has been, uh, you know, holds up very well when analyzed through a Western science lens. One challenge that we've had is, you know, finding ways of analyzing this data in a way that translates into decisions and actions by regulatory agencies. And it's been a long and difficult process and probably will continue to be for the foreseeable future. Um, so these are some examples of how good quality data is crucial to long-term environmental protection and for uh, glyphic member tribes. It really does apply to virtually every category of environmental uh, issue that you can imagine. So I'll stop there and thank you for your time. Thank you, Esteban. Really appreciate it. Um, okay. Uh, last but not least, Rahul. 
Um, all right. Uh, here are your two questions that I have uh, that I think I'm going to just ask back to back. Okay. Um, what can we as individuals and as a community learn from computer uh, security experts about how we can protect and disseminate our data? And what are the computational implications on security of smart home devices, not smartphone, smart home? Um, and uh, okay, I don't think you have any slides. No, I don't. So you're just going to talk. <laughs> cool. Great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I am the last person in the closing panel, so I have to kind of close all the, the fantastic uh, uh, summaries that our panelist has brought up. And one thing I want to start with, like data has amazing power. We can do so many things, so much good with uh, actual data. I mean, we can uh, influence policies, we can help learn things better, we can do things more efficiently. What we do as a security experts, we are uh, somehow want to like step back and see what things can go wrong when you collect some data or a particular way you want to use some data. And um, I don't want to see ourselves as an obstructionist, but we, are, we have a healthy dose of skepticism whenever we want to do something good. Um, so one thing I want to I want to talk about it today is a, is a concept that we use in security. It's called threat modeling. It's a hypothetical analysis of threats that can compromise your functionality or some the good that you're trying to do with something, some system, how that thing can be abused, how that thing can go wrong. And I don't want to like teach the whole thing. I teach in, you can take my class to learn about this. But <laughs> the, so, <laughs> the quick thing is you can think about who may be interested in the system or the data that you are building. Not in a good sense, but in a bad sense. What, who can take advantage of that information or compromise the system to learn about the data uh, illegitimately. Now, then step back and think what are their capabilities or what they can do to get that access. So these are the two important aspects that we hypothesize when we think about security. Who can have, who will be interested in this data, who can use this data in a malicious purpose, and how they can get access to that information or access to that system. And um, you, if you step back and think about th th these two notions, often it will help understand the security and privacy risk of whatever we want to do with the data. And so the so example could be you want to collect a data about people walking in the street to understand how, the, the, how people are driving cars or like how, how many people are using walking on this uh, pedestrian walk. It seems to be benign data, but if it's not taken, uh, collected carefully, it can pose huge privacy problem uh, of the users. Often this kind of data collected based on your know, Bluetooth signals of your phone. And you can eventually, the system can help you track the person throughout the city. So that is an example of smart city. It has a good intention to understand where people are going, what people are doing, but that can, that can inadvertently pose a privacy risk. Now that, so who can be interested? Well, advertiser can be interested, but maybe we're not, they're not necessarily the, the worst kind of malicious uh, actors in the system. But it can also be uh, an attackers who are constantly trying to understand where people are going and what people are doing. They can even uh, uh, target particular person and look, get their location information. So once you, uh, once we narrow down who may be interested, like someone who would like to know the location of people, then you can try to think about how they can get access to that information. For example, can the, the way you are collecting the data, is it stored in a location that nobody else can have access to? So often we kind of stop at that level. Well, how anyone else can get access to? How is the legitimate persons are getting access to? Well, maybe through password, maybe through a, including a two-factor. Is it possible that the attacker can get access to that password? Is it possible that, that one of the legitimate person maybe accidentally post that password into some kind of GitHub repository by a uh, mistake? So you go back and try to understand, is it possible, what are the different ways that attacker can get access to those systems, and then try to minimize what are the threat associated with it. Uh, so this is one example of threat modeling, uh, where we're trying to analyze the security of a system and 
if sometimes we don't know exactly how to fix the problem, but at least we will know what are the problem exists. And then you can go talk to us. I mean, we still have job, right? <laughs> so you can come talk to us and how do you fix like once, because you are the expert when you're collecting the data or designing a system. You know what things you are collecting and who might be interested. How do you fix it once you find a problem is something we can help with. We have designed a lot of systems through which uh, we secure data. Um, the another aspect I want to bring it up is the we, we have this whole pipeline of data. We collect data from various sources and then make decisions based on it. How do you ensure that those the whatever we're collecting is trustworthy? What if someone is poisoning? Because downstream, we have seen sometimes it's unintentionally data can be biased. I think we have seen the AI ethics. Uh, data sometimes naturally is biased. Sometimes data can be intentionally poisoned or, or biased that can affect the policy decision. So we also need to make sure that how do you protect the integrity of the system that we are building, integrity of the data that we are collecting, uh, because we are going to use that information to do something, something more important. Uh, the third thing is, when you are acting on a data, is it possible that action that you are taking can be dangerous? And it can, can the, uh, uh, the certain part, certain actions can be so dangerous that can be destructive. So uh, a very hypothetical and a random example is, for example, we are making decisions based on a farm, based on the data collected. What if someone can tamper with the data and your actions could be disastrous for the farm? And we need to be, again, the same going back to this threat modeling concept, we need to think, question all of those points and step back and then understand, can we make sure that we don't take any destructive actions ever or without a human intervention? Can we make sure that people cannot, we have always this integrity, we can check the integrity of the data that we collect. So this is, in a nutshell, different ways we try to analyze the, the threats that a system can experience uh, throughout its life cycle. And uh, we, we want all the people who are using data or designing systems to sometimes think about these details and um, problems. Now, the second part is sometimes, uh, you know, we are collecting data. I gave you an example of a smart city, how the data can be uh, collected and used. There are similar things data ha is creating, um, like, like, like the data we are collecting in our smart offices, smart homes can be extremely useful in making things more efficient. Turn off the light when people are not there. You know when people are using, you can also control the AC and all those things. But those data can also be privacy sensitive. Sometimes um, this uh, privacy problems around data could be could go to a, a complete extreme. So one random example: um, all of our uh, property deeds are public information by law, so people can go and search. They contain a lot of sensitive information. Well, in some sense, uh, a name and address and all those things. Now, if you consider a person of a survivor of domestic violence who just want to keep their address hidden or they don't want to reveal, often it's very, very hard. If you want to access to insurance, you have to provide your address. You have to go to phone uh, or, or get a job, you have to provide some address. Sometimes post PO box will work, other time you have to provide that information. Now, before things got digitized, it was okay because it was save in some kind of county clerk. Someone has to physically go to this clerk's office to get this information. Now these are all digitized. And then we build system on top of these things because that this data can be useful to easily and effectively search those information on the internet. And that's where the problem arises because now it's not a, uh, uh, these are ideally public information in some sense, but it can be used to cause harm. Uh, of course, I mean, domestic violence may be one of the extreme examples that I gave, but you can think of these informations can be used for harm. So this is when you harvest data, when you compile data in some ways, or make it public, or even allow others to compile these informations, we have to think about what can go wrong. And so that's where I want to end, like, have some this healthy level of skepticism. Sometimes certain functionalities can be abused and misused. 
take a step back and think about it before we make it public or make it uh, a, a real system. So, okay. Great. Thanks, Robert. Okay. Um, now time for questions. I have a few buzzing around in my head, but uh, I don't know about you all. I want to give you all first priority. Yes, sir. Yeah, I had one comment going back to the uh, first presentation, the question of bad actors. And I think an example of that uh, is this whole issue that's coming up before the city council now about rezoning the question of number of non-related people that should be allowed to live together in the same household. And there's so many ways. That, I mean, that's the official uh, concern, but there's also the question of what the ulterior motives are here. If it's landlords that just want to divide up properties so they can collect uh, higher rents per unit, or if there's a concern about uh, keeping the family unit uh, intact uh, in different parts of the city. Hmm. And then also, uh, in the last presentation, there's that whole question about uh, CCAP and uh, the question of the public's right to know um, regarding the background of different people and how much of that information falls within the public domain and whether or not uh, making that information available can also be uh, disadvantageous to certain people by the fact of their inclusion in CCAP. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that it's kind of a two-edged sword because there are certainly areas where the public has the right to at least some of that information versus the danger of whether or not that type of data can be misused. Hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, any reactions or just, yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know much about, oh, my alarm's going off. Um, I don't know much about that other than when I was in undergrad, I lived in a house with four other people. Um, none of us were related and it was, uh, our city did have one of those laws. Um, and so we had two copies of our lease, one that was real and one to show the cops. Mm. Uh, <laughs> never came up, but we had actually had that discussion Just with our case. landlord. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, and, and CCAP is an, is an amazing example of this problem that, uh, that I just said. It's really good that public should have access to it, but how should we control that access? Should we allow anyone to look at? Should we have some kind of logging? Um, yeah, I don't have a solution. But yeah, this is something we should we should consider or think about when we all build mm -hmm. data based systems. Um, any other other questions? Just general comments. Yes. Sorry, we now have a microphone for people. So sorry we didn't have that earlier. Um, I just wanted to pose a question about the the role of analytics, um, just because. I worked at a company once that did software for enforcing common core standards and it was terrible and I began to be convinced that I was doing more harm than good. And so I guess I was curious about your thoughts about how do you know that you have ground truth and you're not actually with the best intentions doing something that's harmful? I mean, I, anybody can take it, of course. But I mean, you're the uh, learning analytics person. You give a presentation. You're the ethics person. I don't know who wants to go. I'll uh, give you an alley oop here. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> if you're not the student, you don't have ground truth. Mm. So, like, you you don't know what that experience is as an outsider. You also need to know um, how the information is going to be used at the end. So, this I am going to circle this back to ethics, though, and measures of fairness. Uh, that the right measure of fairness, and again, this is only at one uh, vein of substantive fairness. There are some that aren't measured in that way, um, but within that, there are several competing measures of fairness, and the right one depends on the use case, and uh, in part, whether it's considered assistive or punitive. Um, and hmm. the teachers and the students might disagree on whether something is assistive or punitive. Um, so your model might be trained right for one pers uh, perspective, but fundamentally wrong for another, right? So your model is always wrong. In this case, it's like actually bad. Yeah, that's a really nice alley-oop. And I think that circles back to a point that I was making around having different um, tools and platforms with different audiences in mind, because once that becomes a shared effort, 
maybe you're coming with information from your perspective, there's information from another perspective, and that's really where that collaboration, um, those discussions that come in, the devil's advocacy, and maybe you all work collectively to find a, a universal ground truth, right? That holds space for all of those kind of different perspectives. So I wouldn't say there's any clear cut, but again, critical thinking, problem solving, all of that can definitely be a part of that process when we leverage data across various different stakeholders. Is there another question? Okay, yeah. This has been really a great couple of two days, so thanks for everybody being here who's here. Um, one thing that I think has really hit me when you were speaking was um, thinking about the like democratization of data as well as um, you know how much data are out there um, and and who provides the data and credentialing and kind of the importance of credentialing and then also thinking about tech right thinking about um, people's knowledge that maybe we were taught as kids were just stories but it's actually very important and how do you give power to the people who have data like that that's you know uh, traditional knowledge or you know things that maybe should be um, valued more in an area when we are still dealing with um, issues of uh, the importance of credentialing and things like that you know and you know you have to have a master's in GIS or you have to be using ArcGIS instead of QGIS whatever the wherever the Mac guy is you know um, you know like the, those types of things like we um, there's certain signals we use to to say that data are good or bad, and how do you how do you kind of bring those things up to a place where you can make change in people's lives in a positive way? I guess well, I can try. Um, first of all, I, I don't know the answer to a lot of those. A lot of the part of your question, um, there are ways of validating you know there are a lot of personal interviews for example are used in tech a lot um, and tech is again traditional, traditional ecological, ecological knowledge and not, it has other names not technology it's right um, so you know there are different ways of uh, transcribing and archiving this type of story based information that relates to actual in my case natural resource data um, there is an awful lot of just hard data that you can translate. It's like changing data formats, which has been talked about here before. Right? You, you, you get the information in uh, an essay form, um, and you can get out, if, for example, phenology information, you know, things of timing of the seasons and what animals do what during what season. That can be fairly straightforward in transcribing from a narrative version to a spreadsheet uh, that you can then validate with uh, the scientific method. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's constantly evolving, I think, new ways of describing this information. Um, and But mostly, I think, it's just been openness of people to receiving that kind of information. Um, I think that has changed a lot in, in last years, whether it's, you know, staffers who work for federal government or city planners, you know, people are just more willing to accept that information um, as part of their job. So I hope that answers at least part of what you were saying. We have another question in the back. I want to get as many in as we possibly can. Yeah, I'm, I'm so, oh, here, hi. I'm so excited to kind of piggyback on what where this conversation is going. Um, so I have spent a long career in community and citizen science, yeah. which really gets to your um, question of how we expand uh, the voices and democratize science, and uh, not, not only the ways we collect and the people we allow to collect information about our natural world and other, uh, other areas, but also the research questions um, that we ask. So, for example, the communities that you work with in the, along the Great Lakes uh, may be asking uh, different questions, and they should, and we in academia, in, in my mind, should uh, 
provide the resources and be the experts to those working in communities that are faced with, for example, die off of um, wild rice. So how, how do they set up a research um, study to explore the kind of questions that they're interested in finding answers to? So that's what community and citizen science is all about. And I'm just, mm. I, could, I could talk a whole, a whole bizarre on this <laughs> answer, but great conversation, so thank you. I'm gonna say something tongue in cheek. Um, because I, I'm very much a big advocate of community engaged scholarship and kind of listening to communities um, to help set research agendas. Um, but come on, we have academic freedom on this campus. You have to allow faculty to ask the questions. You cannot allow people who do not create knowledge to help ask questions. I'm saying that tongue in cheek because like uh, I really do think sometimes people in academia do push back against like, no, this is my research agenda. I'm, I know the literature. I'm you know, filling the gaps of knowledge in my space. You community members, you know, that's not really an interesting enough question for me to get published in that journal. Um, so, I mean, I, I've definitely had questions of, for instance, air pollution come up and people are like, no, we don't model for air pollution at the neighborhood level. We model for air pollution at like the like huge global level or like multi-state regional level, not necessarily at the neighborhood level. I'm like, well, people want to know about particulates in the air at their neighborhood level. Anyway, so I, I think that also opens up questions about like how, no offense to faculty on this panel, like how open faculty are to like opening up the process of like, hmm, is my research question set by me and a bunch of insiders in academia? Or are we being led by like the people who are experiencing it on the ground or who have other you know, traditional knowledge um, that might lead us in a very different direction and lead us to different gaps in knowledge and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, that's like a big debate right now. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for mentioning that because I feel like this raises the larger conversation of theory versus application. And I have a lot of energy around using the word expert because I understand in academia, you go through a lot of work and time and effort to get to a certain level of knowledge to proclaim that you are an expert. But who's to say that everyone in here is not an expert of their own experience as they navigate the world? And how does that lend itself mm. to different perspectives of expertise from theory to practice and everything in between? So I think that's a really interesting conversation. And I appreciate you all for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, I do have just a selfish question because I'm involved in a uh, project in the city of Madison where their um, cities collect all kinds of data, you all can imagine, sensors, you know, sometimes it's just user experience data, whatever. Um, and they're actually not asking UW-Madison for help around data anal analytics, because they do hire people who do data analytics. They're actually asking for training, um, especially of their frontline staff who are collecting data. Um, and again, this is a little bit around the democratization of like, I mean, we have people who are like literally driving you know, large pickup trucks who are like collecting data or, you know, street machines that are collecting data that are not credentialed or whatever. So anyway, they're just kind of curious about how do we train people about how to collect data, why it's important to collect good data um, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just wondering about the training for, I mean, maybe this is a little citizen science-y too. Like how do you pull people in who are maybe not the credentialed experts, but who are the ones that you rely on collecting good data so that we can, um, you know, make better decisions moving forward. I don't know if y'all have any particular training ideas or thoughts around that, but yeah. This be a great question for Sarah, but she's not on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I know the carpentry Carpentry's works. Community. We've talked about city carpentry. I think it's a better question for Mariah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, come to the data science hub. We do tons of training. Yeah, okay, okay. I mean, and again, it's like they know what they want to train on. They just don't know how to train frontline workers on it because sometimes they're just, these frontline workers are just filling out forms, you know, and they don't really see the, they're just like, oh, whatever, it's a form that I have to fill out. It's like, no, 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 we need that so because of snow removal. We need that for, you know, I don't know, whatever the case is. Um, anyway, maybe we should pull you into that conversation because I'm connecting them with some people in yeah, learning we'll and development. But yes, we have a data science hub and some, uh, 
Wisconsin yeah. Center for Ed Research. Yes, right. Um, do we want to do this right now, really quick? Yes. Michael has a special so I know that all of your heads are abuzz with <laughs> ideas. I'm hoping they're abuzz with ideas and conversations that have been stimulated by uh, the Research Bazaar and by this particular panel discussion in, uh, uh, in, in, in particular panel discussion. And if you have further questions, I really, uh, or further <laughs> conversations, I really encourage you to go across the road to the Data Sciences Institute uh, to actually avail yourself of their um, reception and imbibe yourself with whatever they have to give you uh, and continue these great conversations. I would like once more uh, just to thank uh, both the programming committee for putting together such a, a great uh, uh, program, the, our sponsors, and in particular, uh, all of you participants uh, for being part of making this research bazaar such a success. However, uh, within all of these endeavors, there's always one person who brings things together and <laughs> makes these things work as well as they do. And in this case, that one person is uh, Sarah Stevens, uh, who you can see also still working right now. And we as a collective would like to present you with uh, a small token of our appreciation for all of your efforts. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Sarah, for everything that you've done um, to make this a success. Uh, I know that I was not easy to like work with with my scheduling, so I can only imagine that like that times like 30 um, is how difficult this job was. So I just wanted to say thank you because I know how hard you've worked. Um, there, you want to talk about this? Sure, yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, please give us feedback on this session. It helps us improve the research bazaar every year to get feedback on the different sessions you attended and how useful you found them. Um, and we'll continue to use that feedback in planning next year's research bazaar. A uh, reminder, you can find out about data science events, training, news um, on campus and off campus, actually, in our newsletter, Data Science at UW. Um, you can sign up at the address there. And there's an archive there, so you can sneak peek at it in case you're not sure you want to sign up, and then you can sign up.